Welcome to episode 32 of Counseling Corner, where I try to give practical application to biblical truth. As always, I am your host, Isaac Johnson. And uh, boy, this last week was a little rough for me. Uh, I was fighting some kind of head cold or illness. I rarely get a fever, but but I did. So it knocked me out and I'm still just kind of recovering. Um, so uh, I feel like it's one of those situations where, you know when somebody gets up and does a speech and says, I didn't sleep the night before, so this is going to suck. No, the content's going to be great today. I promise you that. Um, if my voice is a little challenging, um, just bear with me, but I think I should be fine. So just dive right in here. And I just want to say that, you know, after working as a marriage and family therapist and just seeing firsthand the devastating effects divorce can have on children, adults, and families, I can really empathize with this anonymous quote that I found. You know, it says, the pain of divorce is like a knife through the soul, leaving behind a trail of uh, emptiness and belonging. It is a cruel reminder that even the strongest bonds can be broken, leaving us shattered and lost. You know, not to sound overly dramatic, but I'm just convinced that divorce is one of the most traumatic experiences a person can go through in life. You know, God designed marriage to be a permanent joining together of two lives into one, where two people literally become, as Genesis 2.18 puts it, one flesh. You know, so when the sacred union, when it's severed, Regardless of the reasons, it rips both the man and woman apart at the soul level, you know, leaving behind a physical, emotional, and spiritual just trail of destruction that can literally poison a family tree at the root level. So you would imagine that, that any person who, who has suffered this kind of wounding, they would want to take some time, kind of lick their wounds, do some deep healing before jumping into a new relationship. But unfortunately, I see too many people doing just the opposite. You know, they choose to cope with the pain and loneliness of their loss by inviting another human being into their mess. So instead of doing the work they need to do to get better, they give in to the hedonistic impulse to just try and simply feel better. And this is why the divorce rate for second marriages is just significantly higher, sometimes as high as 70% compared to a first marriage, which is pretty crazy. You know, Because people mistakenly believe that they are making a fresh start, when in reality, they're just unknowingly bringing their unresolved trauma from their old relationship into their new one, which is forcing their new marriage to do the work of two. But I can hear many of you saying, you know, I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. I'm not the one who chose to leave my marriage. Am I supposed to just accept singlehood and take a vow of celibacy? And my response would be, of course not. You know, God is a redemptive God and and he can heal any broken area in our lives, even if we were the ones who did the breaking, which is often the case. However, you know, God's healing, it takes time, effort, consistency, and intentionality. You know, God doesn't heal our pain by changing our scenery, but rather by changing us. So this means that before we are going to be any good in a new relationship, we have to make sure we are not taking our old one with us. So how do we accomplish this? Well, first, you have to make sure that you are legally divorced. I mean, I'm just amazed at how many people start dating a new person before they are even legally disconnected from the old person that they were married to. I mean, first of all, you're not morally freed from your marriage. If if you're still married, you're still legally married. So God's going to have a really difficult time blessing your new relationship if you are morally still tied to the old one. And the other thing is, is you're not honoring to the new person that you're with since you're only giving them a percentage of you. You've still got this other part of you that's still tied to this other person. So I don't know. I don't know about you, but no healthy person is really going to want you with strings attached. And then on a practical level, I mean, you're just going to be distracted if you're if you're in a new relationship with somebody while you're still trying to do all the proceedings of your divorce and finalize everything, you're going to be super distracted and you're probably going to concede things in your divorce that you're going to later regret, you know, in an attempt to just get it over with. 
And I've seen that happen so many times where people just maybe they they don't um, work through a custody issue or or a financial situation or they kind of get hosed in something because their focus is not on the the divorce proceedings and it's just wrapped up in this new person. So the first thing is, is man, just make sure you are legally divorced before you even think about a first date. Um, second, give yourself one year minimum to heal. So people ask me a lot of times like, what's the time frame for healing after a divorce? And I there's been lots of studies, but there's nothing definitive that says, you know, if you wait five years after your divorce, then your second marriage is going to be perfect. No, that, that's not true. But what I have found is that we do need to wait. I, I've noticed at least one full year from the time that your divorce is legally official. So not from the time that you were separated from your partner, but from the time that the, the in, in the courts that the, the divorce is legally official, that seems to be something our brain can kind of accept as, as a finality. And then you have to go through that calendar year of just experiencing all the dates associated with your ex, birthdays, holidays, anniversaries. And if you're, you know, you had kids involved, you know, you need a full year just to implement a parenting plan or to work out all the logistical hiccups that are going to come up in, in that first year. So, you know, the, the main thing is you're just not going to know how all these things will impact you physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially until you actually go through them. You're not going to know what it's like to to go through that first anniversary without your ex or um, you can't predict what that's going to be like. You just have to do it and feel it. And you don't want to do that with a new person. It's like you have this new person now where you, you're creating a new anniversary. You're still trying to deal with your old anniversary. It's going to be very convoluted, um, not going to be a good opportunity for you to heal. You know, so even if your relationship with your ex was contentious, you know, you were still used to just doing everyday life with that person. And you have to get accustomed to doing all the activities and events of the marriage without them. So I think it's just practical that, you know, at the very minimum, before you start dating, um, one year, it sounds like a long time, but it, it really isn't if, you, if you're, you know, intentional about it. But just one year from the time that your divorce is official before you start dating, I think is, is just really good. Third, you need to embrace singlehood. So while you're taking that one year or longer, you know, you know, if just just really embracing the opportunity that is before you of being single, not not to go out and sow your wild oats, but but just to do some really good things that maybe you weren't able to do when you were married. Because if you just spend your time as a single person constantly looking for ways to no longer be single, you're just going to create an environment of desperation that will cause you to overlook significant red flags in yourself and probably in the other person as well. You know, you're going to find someone because man, there's always some immature person out there willing to scratch that single itch, but you're going to end up in a worse relationship than the one that you just exited. I guarantee it. I've seen it over and over and over again. So embrace singleness, you know, just try to see being single as a benefit, even if it wasn't a benefit that, that, that you were preferring. You wanted to be married. You were hoping to stay married for life. Remember, 95% of people who get married, they're gonna, they believe they're going to stay married for life. So when we are suddenly single, it can be a little jarring. But if we can see it as an opportunity, it can really be helpful. Be, so be opportunistic. You, know? you want to create a fulfilling world that you can invite a new person into someday. Because if you don't, you're just going to waste time and energy just making that new person your world. And nobody really wants to be up on a pedestal. It gets old really quick. So I would just say, you know, while you're single, embrace it. Do things that, you know, you couldn't have done as a married person. Create some new hobbies and interests. Uh, maybe go on a missions trip or just whatever it is that you know that that's going to bring some wholeness in you. Like we said, you know, go and, and, and just, I don't know. I, I don't want to give you a bunch of examples, but I just think the things that are going to really enrich your life are going to be good. And, and just embrace that because uh, desperation, it's not sexy. It's not a fragrance that Calvin Klein is ever going to market. Believe me, you know, we could just hear Matthew McConaughey somehow on a commercial saying something or, or wasn't it uh, Johnny Depp, I think did some perfume commercials that were pretty bad. So 
We, we really don't want to be wearing the aroma of desperation. Fourth, deal with your unhealthy coping strategies before even considering a first date. You know, any addictions, habits, or other coping strategies that you develop to deal with maybe the loneliness, depression, rejection, abuse that you might have endured in your marriage, those are going to get unintentionally projected onto a new relationship if you don't develop a recovery plan. And it's pretty common, uh, you know, if, if we're in a bad marriage, maybe, you know, it's, we just, they were human beings and we develop uh, coping strategies that are often not very healthy, maybe overeating, maybe alcohol, maybe, you know, pornography or, or whatever, um, as a way of dealing with some of these um, deep emotions, these these deep woundings. And a lot of times we think that, well, I just, you know, they were caused by the bad marriage. So now that I'm in a new relationship, I don't have to worry about those issues anymore. And And that is just Never true. Now, the bad marriage may have been the catalyst for you starting those addictions, but it, just ending the bad relationship isn't going to end uh, that addiction because once that neural pathway gets established in your brain, it's it's there for life. So I had a guy where he, you know, he was he developed a drinking problem in in a, a marriage that was pretty rough, and and he had you know he in, in his mind he had a lot of justifiable reasons to do it. Um, and then he just believed that, you know, well, once the marriage ended, he was going to be okay. And, and then, you know, everything was great at first in this new relationship. But then as soon as that new relationship faced some struggles, which it will, he went right back to drinking. And it just, it was even worse than it was before. So I just think we really got to be intentional that, you know, if you're, when you come to that new relationship, when you start dating again after divorce, make sure that you can say to this person, here's my recovery plan. Here's what I have been struggling with. I'm always very hesitant when people say in a dating situation where they're like, oh, I used to struggle with this. No, if you've created a neural pathway, if you've created an addiction, you've fed that thing, it's there uh, and it'll be there the rest of your life. That doesn't mean you'll act on it, but it's there. So you want to be able to say, what am I actually actively doing about it? What's my recovery plan? Because people aren't really that freaked out about our issues. They're freaked about freaked out about our, our, our unwillingness to deal with those issues, to think that they're just gone and, and, and behind us. And that's just not true. So really take some time. You're going to do yourself and your new partner a favor by just, you know, taking some time and just dealing with whatever those addictions or habits might be. And then finally, the fifth, and and I really believe the most important thing we need to do before dating again is work through any layers of unforgiveness in yourself or just with your ex. Um, Again, just because you are no longer with the person who wounded you doesn't mean that you are free from the effects of the wound. In fact, you know, those, those wounds, like we said, they just carry on. Uh, They're there, uh, especially at those deeper levels. So maybe you're the person that did the wounding in in a marriage, you know, where you were said some things, did some things that you're certainly not proud of. And you're feeling a lot of shame. You're you're very embarrassed now that you're single. And, you know, you got to deal with that shame to get your confidence back. Because otherwise, you know, you're going to going to go into a new relationship and you're going to be subconsciously asking of this new person to be your confidence booster. And and that's not the job of a person in a marriage. That's just not, that's not the way God designed marriage to be. So, you know, shame is a normal thing and we can be embarrassed. And so we got to talk about it. We got to process it. Sometimes that means, you know, doing some counseling or whatever, but deal with the, the shame in, in yourself to work through those, those where you can kind of forgive yourself um, you know, so, and then the other thing is, is maybe you're dealing with unresolved anger, fear, abuse, neglect, rejection, just, or other emotional injuries that you received in your marriage from your ex. Um, and if you'd, again, if you don't deal with those, they're going to continue to deal with you in your new relationship. So, uh, forgiveness is, a, it can be a lengthy draining process. I, I know, but it's well worth the work because you don't, want to just take all those issues into a new relationship and just lay them at, it'd be like coming to the altar in a second marriage and just laying all this crap down in front of the new person you're marrying and saying, Hey, here's what you get to deal with now. Now that wouldn't be any fun. And it's going to haunt you, you know, if you, if you haven't worked through those things. 
So, so that process, how you, you deal with unforgiveness, you know, again, you may need to go, there's plenty of books out there that you can do podcasts, um, counseling, but it's a process. It's, it's probably going to take you months, maybe even a couple of years to work through those layers, depending on the kinds of wounds you received, um, or the kinds of wounds you inflicted. So, so people can do ask me though, how do you know when you've really done the work of forgiveness? Maybe what are some indicators? And, and I think there's two, there's probably plenty, but two that come to mind is one, you're no longer blaming yourself. So if you're the person that did the wounding, you've come to a place where you can accept God's forgiveness and you're no longer like beating yourself up about it, no longer blaming yourself. And if you're in a, you know, if you were on the receiving end of somebody else wounding you, you're no longer blaming them. You know, you know, you're just not blaming your ex for anything because I think that is just a good indicator that you're still tied to them. The other indicator is that, you know, you, you know, you can be in the same environment with yourself or with your ex and be calm, you know? So if, if being by yourself is really, really challenging because it causes you to have to think about all the things that you still did and you're still not forgiving yourself. I don't know that you've really worked through self-forgiveness there. Um, and if, if, you know, if you're in a situation where your ex just walks in the room or you get a phone call from them and your skin's crawling or you're trying to jump out the back window, Again, I just think I would really question whether you've really forgiven them or not, because to, to truly forgive somebody, they just don't have any power over you anymore. You're not tethered to them emotionally or spiritually. And so that's how we can often tell when we've, when we've really done the work of forgiveness is, you know, you're not blaming and, and, and you're also can be in that same space with that person and, and be okay. I'm not saying you're going to love it, but you're going to be okay. So just any area where you still notice your ex having power over you or, or where you're still beating yourself up, you know, again, that's just evidence that you might still have some unforgiveness to work out. So those are kind of the indicators of, um, you know, whether you have forgiven or maybe are still needing to do some work there. And, uh, so, and as you're going through this, again, it's, it can be trying. It's, 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 it's a very difficult thing working through divorce. And so, I would just encourage you don't do it alone. And there's some great resources out there. Divorce Care is my number one uh, resource that I refer people to. You can go and find a, a, a local group near you at uh, www.divorcecare.net. That's all one word, divorcecare.net. And it's a Christian organization and they, they're just been around a long time and their, their material is fantastic. I've worked through it with so many people and, um, and it allows you to just be with other people who have gone through something similar where you can really, um, learn from one another and, and the materials researched well. Um, and it, and it just gives you, it shows you kind of what, what to expect and how to work through it. You can also do counseling or mentoring with somebody where again, you're just walking, uh, with somebody who's maybe, got some experience in, in helping people with divorce or, or have kind of gone down that path themselves. And again, they can just give you perspective and keep you encouraged. And, you know, books or podcasts can be helpful too. I'm not going to recommend those necessarily simply because you can go to Amazon and just put in a search and find a lot of really good um, options there. But whatever the resource you choose when you're doing the healing of divorce, I'd really encourage you to, you know, find, um, Find a resource that is challenging, that is objective, that, that is encouraging to you, not just some place where you're commiserating, where you're allowed to just kind of complain and, and just wallow. I mean, I don't know that that does any good for anybody. So um, really just try to, if that's a resource, if you just find that you're going to a group and all you guys do is complain and whine for an hour, probably find a new group. So, so while the effects of divorce will likely last for a lifetime, we do not have to be haunted by them in our next relationship if we are willing to do the hard work of healing. And even if maybe you have already jumped prematurely into a new relationship, it's not too late to step back and, and work through some or, or just all of the steps of healing that I mentioned today. You know, that might mean taking a strategic break from the relationship that you're currently in, or maybe just both of you working on these steps together. And if you're dating somebody now and, 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 it, and it looks like it's heading towards marriage, 
I would highly encourage you both to do some premarital counseling, maybe uh, just to make sure that you're, you're both fully aware of the issues that you're bringing into this new union, as well as any baggage your partner might be unknowingly packing. So um, I also recommend the book by Les and Leslie Parrott. So you could, as a couple, you could go through this book called Getting Your Second Marriage Off to a Great Start. Excellent book. They, they've done a lot of work in this field. So any work we are willing to do today will help ensure, you know, tomorrow uh, is a better outcome than yesterday. So I just want to encourage you, you know, that, that this is worth the effort, worth the time. Um, if, you, if you have any feedback for me of any kind that you want to give, please just reach out to me at yakimamft at gmail.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A-M-F-T at gmail.com. And uh, please just, um, you know, share this with people if you find this helpful, you know, give a review, just anything I can do to kind of get the word out just to help more people. I, I really appreciate that. You know, so until next time, I would just um, want to wish you a, a blessed and impactful week. <laughs>